Would you say out loud with me, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is the ultimate authority in my life, and I submit to its teaching. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the truth of an amazing story that we're about to look at again. Thank you for kids that illustrate it in front of us. Thank you for the stories, Jackie and Mary, communion, or songs of worship that step us into your presence. Thank you for generous people who give. God, speak to us now by your spirit, and I ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38. It says, Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. David was less than 20 years of age when he faced this legendary giant named Goliath. He was the youngest of eight brothers. He is introduced to us as a shepherd. He's tending sheep in the hill country of Palestine. He was also a very gifted musician. He was a songwriter. He was good with words. Probably, on so many levels, his devotion to God began at four, five, six, seven, eight years of age. Can you imagine that that child became king? He was handsome. He genuinely had a heart after God. At 30 years of age, he stepped into a position of leadership, and he is the most beloved leader in Israel's history. He reigned as king for 40 years. Church, let me tell you, God's hand was upon his life. God's favor was upon his life. He did have feet of clay. As probably all of you are aware, That reality was painfully demonstrated with a woman named Bathsheba and the conniving of a plan to have her husband killed on the front lines of battle. But all in all, when you look at David's full life, and we have more in the Bible about this man than most, when you look at the whole of his life, he lived a remarkable life. He was real, he was raw, he was a warrior. And if you look closely at David's life, and one of the wonders about this, because we have enough material to look at it and find out of his life emerging what I would call remarkable life lessons that each of us can learn from. So yes, it is a story. In fact, it's probably the most famous Bible story of all time. And a lot of children know the story, but as adults, if we step into it, there are things about David that if you allow them to speak to you, they can shape and they can mold your life. And that is our task today. I want to show you a picture. We've all seen pictures similar to this. You see a very young, confident teenager swirling a stone in his slingshot, about to unleash its power into the forehead of a Philistine giant named Goliath. David's faith, it inspires me. His courage intrigues me. And his victory that day gives me confidence as I face the giants that stand directly in front of me in this particular season of my own life. You see, I remember facing specific giants when I was David's age. I remember I came to faith when I was 18. I remember the giants that faced off on me in that season of my life. Truth be told, however, as I face giants every decade of my life, every year of my life, And now at the age of 62, I still live with a slingshot in my hand and with five smooth stones put aside. I do this because I know that it's only a matter of time when another deception, when another bully, when another intimidating enemy of my faith in God will need to be taken down. And church, can I tell you that God is faithful? What about you? 
What are the names of the giants that you're facing this morning? What are the lies that you're tempted to believe? What are the intimidating words that directed your way to try to get you to quit, maybe to get you to run, to stop, or to shut you up? You see, giants like Goliath stand in front of all of us. They have different names, names like fear. Some in our church face the giant called addiction, some rejection. Names like offense, that's probably a giant that all of us have faced in the more recent past. Some of the giants, their name is pornography, maybe silence. I have faced giants named regret, anger, depression, sickness. Other giants that I've faced are disappointment, anxiety, loneliness, greed. What I want to show you this morning is that so much of David's success in this moment, so much of his success, standing there before Goliath, began in his life years before he was about 18 years of age, when he was really young. Everything David had been and everything that he was going to become was already inside him. God was shaping and God was molding David like clay on a potter's wheel. And I believe the good that was inside of David is also inside of you this morning. Some of you don't see it yet. There are those in this room that you don't believe it, but it's there. It's true. There's a David inside you. I want to look at something that happened to David a short time before the Goliath story. Let me just read it to you. First Samuel 16. So he, and the he is Samuel, asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Can anyone say amen? Wow. You know what he was? He was anointed king at that moment. As I said, he was the youngest of eight boys. And Samuel the prophet was called by God to anoint the next king. And he knew that one of Jesse's sons was that king. Saul was the current king of Israel, but he had already lost God's favor. And here's the, here's the amazing thing. It would take over a decade for David to eventually become king. He didn't step into his kingdom until he was 30 years of age. He was anointed to be king about the age of 18, a short time prior to killing Goliath. And so those 12 years between becoming king and first being anointed king would prove to be one of the most difficult seasons in David's development as a leader. And that's where some of you are right now. God's hand is upon your life. His calling is upon your life. And some of you even recognize that. And you're wondering, when is that going to happen? I'll get to it in just a second, but you need to trust God for promotion because God is the one who gives the ultimate promotion. And the church said, amen, you need to know that. There's a whole lot of learning between now and then. There's a whole lot of learning between David being anointed king and him taking up the position of king. 1 Samuel chapter 18. After taking down Goliath, you think that there would be celebration in their streets, and there was. And you think that David may have ridden that wave really, really high. But this is what happened in reality. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel and met King Saul with singing and dancing. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. 
They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcibly upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it saying to himself, I will pin that boy to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Can you imagine that? I mean, seriously, can you imagine that? David became target practice for King Saul. David happened to work in a palace for a mad, angry, backslidden king. And you think your boss is hard to work with. Whoa. It's really important to remember that Saul, being the king, certainly had to watch this younger man in his shadow. But the thing that you know about David, if you read the full story, is there was a coup that was about to take place, really. David could have just given in to the power that was given to him. He could have given in to this political coup, and he could have been ushered in. But David had learned something. He had learned to say no to certain things and yes to other things. I want everyone in the work in the room to say the word no. Say it loudly. No. You know what David said no to? He said no to rebellion. He said no, I will not rebel. He said yes. Everyone say the word yes. He said yes to honor. He learned these traits as a young man. And we find from the story that he chooses five smooth stones from the water brook. And I wanted to illustrate these five lessons that emerge out of David's life. These five lessons, they're in your newsletter. I'm not going to take the time. I don't have the time to go through each of them. But in your newsletter, you'll see These are character traits in the life of David, and they tell us something about who he was as a man. First of all, David developed early in his life a heart of worship, a mentality for serving, a character of submission, and courage for leadership. I want you to know, church, that these things were in David when he was a young boy. Jesse, he probably was somewhat of a standoffish dad. He had all of his other sons. I'm not sure to what degree that Jesse was able to influence his boy, but I want to talk to all the parents in the room, and I want to remind you that you're raising children for the glory of God. You need to instill within your boys and within your girls courage. You need to instill within them what the worship of God is all about and why it's so important. You need to teach them to say no to the right things and to say yes to the even better things. You need to teach them, and to example before them, that servanthood is a genuine, honorable thing to model. For those grandparents in the room, the same is true for you. We live in an interesting culture nowadays. A lot of parents are, are raising children, I said that incorrectly, a lot of grandparents are raising children, or at least they're in your home. And so our grandchildren are certainly those that uh, need to be cuddled and loved and celebrated, but you're in their life to be an example to them, okay? Remember that. Always honor that. I've learned over the years that my adult daughters are probably watching me closer now than at any other time in my life. Just the truth. I, I didn't expect it, I mean, when they're raised in your home, you're doing what you're doing, and they see it, and they, you know, they, they choose to do whatever they choose to do. But when they become adults, they watch more closely. My oldest daughter, Ashley, bought me a Father's Day card this past June. And uh, it, it said, on the front cover, it said, Dad, you were right about everything. Yeah. That's what I said, Steve. I said the same thing. Thank you. But the truth be told, I clearly wasn't right about everything. But I was right about a lot. And usually it takes children to grow up in a certain way and to watch with eyes that are more mature than their younger eyes. But these are the things that I'm teaching you. 
that David learned, these examples of godliness that were in his life before he even faced off with Goliath. Uh, Lesson number two, David embraced seasons of brokenness as opportunities to learn. I want to ask you, how do you handle disappointment? So it's a legitimate question. When everything goes south, when, when it doesn't play out the way that you want it to play out, how do you handle that? I submit to you that David, although he was confident in God, I submit that he was somewhat of a broken man before he ever stood before Goliath. But I can assure you that over the next several years of his life, certainly between the ages of 18 and 30, he became a broken man. In fact, I heard someone use the phrase, he was beautifully broken. And that brokenness created God's character inside of him that would eventually make him into an amazing leader. You've heard me say over the years, uh, there's a book called A Tale of Three Kings written by Gene Edwards. Uh, It's a wonderful little novel that takes the scripture and expands upon it a bit. Gene Edwards said this. He says, God has a university. It's a small school. Few enroll, even fewer graduate. Very, very few indeed. God has his school because he does not have broken men and women. Instead, he has several other types of people. What are the things that break a man and a woman? For some, tragically, brokenness comes into our childhood when situations beyond our control have impact upon our innocence. Some of us cause a degree of brokenness into our own lives by the poor choices that we make, uh, sometimes really stupid choices, and those choices have impact. I know that because I speak from my own experience. But most of the time, brokenness comes to us in the form of rain, wind, and flood that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 7. Broken comes into our life during the grind of life, the daily details of life. Occasionally, friendships go south. An offense threatens to sever the relationship between you and someone close. Sickness comes. A financial crisis that no one anticipated gets dropped at your doorstep. A tragedy happens. The kid that you raise and that you love is living out of control. Sometimes you lose a child or a spouse or a friend. I mean, the absolute list is endless. I'm telling you, church, that brokenness comes to us in different forms and fashions, and I'm not telling you to embrace it as a friend, but I am telling you that God uses broken situations in our life to create his character inside of us. Gene Edwards in The Tale of Three Kings, he put it this way, He says, David was called in a very uncomfortable position. However, he seemed to grasp a deep understanding of the unfolding drama in which he had been caught. He seemed to understand something that few of even the wisest men of his day understood, something that in our day, when men are wiser still, even fewer understand. And what was that? God did not have, but God very very much wanted to have men and women who would live in pain. God wanted a broken vessel. That may sound odd to your ears, but those words are true. Remember Sheila Walsh? She was on stage here several years ago. Sheila came to this church. She said this. She said, my brokenness is a better bridge for people than my pretend wholeness ever was. Lecrae, a lot of you know that name. You've got to admit that you're broken before you can be made whole. And then uh, John Ortberg, he says this, hear this. This is it's a little bit hard to say because of the words, but let me just read it to you. He says, if ever there were a true, just as I am church, if ever there were a community where everybody could bring all their bag and their brokenness with them without neat and tidy, happy endings quite yet, if ever there were a group where everyone was loved and no one pretended we could not make room enough inside the building. And the church said, amen. And that's the type of church I know that I have in my heart. That's what I desire for Christ's chapel. I have discovered over the years that God uses the painful events in our life 
to mold and to shape us. Part of that process is to teach me to trust God more. And as I walk that journey of trusting God more, it's important for me to remember that it usually requires that there are tears in my eyes, that there are scars on my heart. And there should always be a slingshot in my hand. I regret the pain that is connected to the brokenness in many of our lives. I regret that. But God is using pain to shape and to mold you into a leader and to teach you something about taking down giants. A third point is that uh, David looked to God for promotion. Amen? One of the most difficult life lessons that many of you will ever learn is to trust God for promotion. Can I tell you, do not sell your soul. Do not sell your soul for a promotion. Don't compromise your convictions to get ahead. Learn the secrets. Learn the contentment of being happy with what you have and where you are. Ask God to promote you in his timing. Your time will come. Sometimes when you least expect it is when it comes. And that's exactly what happened in the life of David. Look at this story. Chapter 17, verse 14, David was the youngest. The three older followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. He's learning here. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning, evening. He took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son, David, take the roasted grain, the 10 loaves of bread, Take them to your brothers. Hurry to the camp. Take along the ten cheeses. I mean, goodness. His brothers were men. They were fighting. He's taking food to them. See how they're doing. Come back. Tell us how they are. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel. You're not a man yet, David, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock to care as a shepherd and loaded up and set out, and Jesse had directed, and He reached the camp of the army as it was going out to its battle's position. They were shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistine were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies. In other words, he's doing everything that he's been asked to do. He ran to the battle line and he asked his brothers, how are you? Dad wants to know. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, he stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Let me tell you, you're never too old to kill a giant. Amen? And you're never too young to kill a giant. These are the lies and the intimidations that giants taunt us. Let me tell you, I know, I've heard them for many years. They say things like, you can't, you never will. You've wasted too much time. You're too young. You're too old. You've made too many mistakes. Nobody believes in you. Those are his lies. That's what those giants say. Maybe today, perhaps right now, you stop listening to those lies and you start believing that there's a David inside of you. David said to Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 17, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out and fight against the Philistine. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. David said to Saul, listen, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Whoa, the attitude changed all of a sudden. I mean, Goliath, he's spouting off, and all the Israelites, all the warriors run and hide. And David said, who is this giant? That's his conversation with Saul. (laughs) You know what? Sometimes we just simply forget how God has been faithful to us over the years. We just forget. Some of you here this morning, this is true this morning. It was certainly true last night. 
Just the sheer fact that you're listening to my words, that you're here sitting in this room is proof, is testimony of the faithfulness of God in your life. God has been faithful to you. But most of us have specific examples of God's faithfulness in our life. So stop hiding, stop running, learn the lessons of God's faithfulness in the past, choose to trust, choose to believe, choose to forgive, choose to live how God has called you to live. Pick up that slingshot, put that stone in that leather strap and have the courage to look that giant in the eyes and say, today you die. Today, I live. How many of you, uh, you've probably seen portions of this, the movie uh, Shawshank Redemption, I, I think is. is I mean, it's, it's one of those movies, it's on television 400 times a week. <laughs> and I've watched it through to through. Cindy gets after me all the time. She says, there are, and she's right, there are a handful of movies. I could have seen that movie. 20 times in its entirety, it comes on. This isn't quite up to that par, but I, I love this movie. There's a scene, and if you don't know anything about it, there's a gentleman in the, in the movie. His name is Andy uh, Dufresne, I think is how you pronounce his last name. He was put in prison for a crime he didn't commit. His wife had been murdered, and uh, someone had murdered his wife, and he uh, was uh, accused of it, and they found him guilty. He ends up in prison. And um, he's, he's, he's a brilliant young man. And in the movie, he just develops relationships with certain ones, uh, one gentleman particularly. Uh, his nickname was Red. And uh, he was there, uh, we're talking uh, Andy, he was there for uh, several, uh, several decades, 23 years. And uh, he somewhere along the way started digging a tunnel out of uh, his cell, uh, a tunnel to freedom. And he just uh, needed the courage to attempt his escape. And there is this scene. I mean, there's a lot that happens in prison. I can't go through the whole details. But there's this scene the night before he's ready to escape. No one knows, of course. And he has this conversation with uh, Red, uh, with uh, his friend. And he's, he's talking somewhat in code. He doesn't say, hey, Red, I'm escaping tonight. He doesn't say anything like that. But he just says enough that Red knows that something is up. And there's this one line that Andy says to his friend Red. He says, get busy living or get busy dying. And on this day, David decided to live. There are people in this room, there are men and women in this room, you kind of get caught. I know what feeling caught feels like that season of myself. Sometimes you just have to make a choice. You have to pull a stone, put it in a slingshot. Then you have to defy the odds. You have to look a giant right in the eye. And you have to do what David did. See, this is a great little story. It's a beautiful story. It's a fun story. The kids, they portray it. We see the videos, we laugh, we love it. But oh my, there's nothing really funny about the giants that intimidate us. And there are a lot of us who are in caves hiding. There are a lot of us who don't even face the giants. But I'm telling you, the best place to live is with a slingshot in your hand, with a stone in that slingshot. And you decide to do what David did. See, we know the end of the story. We love it. We, it's a wonderful story. We know how it ends. He eventually becomes king. and We say, yeah, rah. Go back to that moment. An 18-year-old kid looking at a warrior, a giant. And this is what he says. Meanwhile, the Philistine with shield bearer in front of him was coming closer to David. And David looked over and saw that he was little more than a Boy, glowing, health, and handsome, the giant said, despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by the gods or by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. You know, I just like righteous indignation sometimes. You know, I, I, I don't know that if I've ever said this. 
I'm kind of a kind of a personality wise, I, I you know, I have a lot of passion inside me, but I think as I relate to people, I really don't raise my voice too much. I don't really kind of go there. Do you know the going there moments of my life? No of you, none of you have ever seen. Well, <laughs> most of you have never seen. But the going there moments of my life have been when I face giants and you face them alone. And I have raised my voice to many a giants. And when I read David here, I'm going to tell you, we're going to end this just in a second, but I'm going to tell you, you need to mark this in your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 17. You need to find that in your Bibles. You need to underline it and you need to take it. And it's pretty long, so you probably won't be able to memorize it. But I, I dare you, I devil dog dare you to get out your Bible and maybe this stone that I'm going to give you just in a second. And you name the giant that you're facing. And then you allow David's words to become your words. And you'll reword it. You'll rephrase it in the moment because the Holy Spirit will help you. But listen to what David says. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down, and I'll cut off your head. This very day, I will give your carcasses of the, to the Philistine armies of the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell down on the ground, face down. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran. It only took a moment for Goliath to be taken down. One stone, one shot, one word, one divine encounter, but it happened. And can I tell you, and I've learned this from experience, there have been times when there's a few, sometimes giants, you think it's just a singular giant, but sometimes giant, Dave, did you know that Goliath had four brothers? Sometimes giants, they, they come together in clusters. And there have been times in my life, again, I could give you some examples. There have been times in my life when I go after the juggler, after the one giant, and, and, and in the name of Jesus, he falls. Can I tell you, it's sometimes like dominoes. He either falls, his brothers fall, or they run and they hide. Because their whole tactic, all they're really good at is intimidation, words, lies, deception. We serve a mighty God. We serve the God of David. And David lives inside of you. Give Jesus a praise offering if you will. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come. And uh, I'm going to ask you if you would stand. I'm going to ask Pastor Mwamba uh, to do for me um, what I had asked him to do. And, and uh, Mwamba, you can go ahead and do that. But you can put some on the stage too as well. There's different ones. I have... Uh, you know, I uh, can you hand me one of the bigger ones there, Pastor Mwamba? I'll just reach in here. I have this wimpy little stone that I had over here. I, sometimes, sometimes you need something a little bit bigger, right, Christy? Just a moment ago, we held bread and we held juice in our hands, and it was a reminder of the faithfulness of God. Um, I've got these, uh, I've got these uh, rocks, these stones up here. I walked in tonight in Insel, or this morning, Insel, I walked in and I shook hands with Insel. And as I was shaking his hand, he reached his hand into his pocket and he pulled out, he pulled out a stone that I, when I preached on David several years ago, and, uh, and he's had that. How long have you had that in your pocket, Insel? 
a long time, decade plus. I remember the day when I put one in your husband's hand. You got it right there? You've got that 12? Okay, let me see that. Seriously, that's the... That's just, is this yours or is this David's? Yeah. I'll give this back. There was a moment in this service years ago, David and Christy were right over there and their kids were right over there. I can't believe I'm telling you this story. And uh, I'm just preaching, doing exactly what I'm doing right now. For reasons I don't even know, actually, I do know. The Holy Spirit just directed me over to their, over to them and uh, to their family. Those boys were so young. Cassie. I had this conversation with Christy. When Christy walked in, when Christy walked into the service, her and Ed, when they were walking in, I said, Christy, come here. Uh, I, I said, I, I'm going to talk about David today. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And uh, the reason I did that is because I'm her pastor. And I, and I, I wanted to warn her because there's a lot of emotion connected to this. But I remember when that family, when their whole family was right over there, and I just walked off the stage and I went right to where they were, right kind of where you are, Matt. And I put one in each of their hands and I said out loud, you're going to need these. And I had no idea what I was saying. I love you, sweetheart. David was killed in a car accident a handful of months after that. I mean, just a handful of weeks after that. Was it that week? One of the absolute crazy, wonderful things that, that I have the honor of doing as a pastor, there's a lot, there's a lot of mess with it. There's, a, there's, there's some heartbreak with it. But I'll tell you what. To have that woman still in this house and to have Michael, to have Cassie, and to have their grandchildren, to have that family in this house, you just watch. And you watch, I think of all the giants they have had to take down over the years. Some of you need, some of you need one of these. You need it on your desk. You need it in your pocket. Maybe you need it uh, in your nightstand. Uh, you need it maybe in your car. You just need it as a reminder. That the God that we serve is a God takes down Goliath. It takes down Goliath. Amen? So, don't worry, I'm not handing one of these to anybody after telling you that. I'm not putting this in anybody's hand. But I am asking you. I'm, I'm losing my mind. I won't hand them to you, but I'll kick them to you right now. <laughs> As our worship team is singing this, it's a, it's, it's a quarter after almost. As our worship team is singing this, I'm going to ask that everyone just step forward. And you can, you can stay up here. You can just get one and you can go right back. And if you'll give me five more minutes, it's 14 after. By 12, 19, we'll be done. I promise. Do me a favor. As they sing, everybody, come up and grab one of these rocks off this altar, will you? Put it, put it in your hand. You can go back to your seats. You can stay right here. Make room for others. Just grab one. Pastor Wamba or Danny, some of the others. Make sure we have enough. There's a, there's a, make sure we have enough. Sing this song. Sing it while you're doing this.
ask them to come in here. Thank you. Thank you. Take that, take that rock and just hold it up. I'll wait just a moment. There's a few more coming here. The reason I asked Pastor Mama to put them on the altar, just this is where you. All right, 16 after I got three minutes. When uh, those of us who are married, when you get married, I tell, I tell couples this all the time. I tell them before they get married, and then usually when they're in my office and it's not going really good, I, I tell them, I go, when you make a vow, when you, when you say your vows, you have no idea what you're really saying. You mean it with all of your heart. You mean it, <laughs> yeah, you mean it, but you have no idea what you're really saying because you don't know what tomorrow looks like. And so, I mean, you mean it. A boy next week turns into next year, turns into the next decade, maybe. And you don't know on a Sunday what's gonna happen on a Tuesday. You, no one just really knows. I believe in the God of tomorrow, amen? Amen? My God is the God of my tomorrow. And I know until I pass from this life into eternal life, I will always, I will always live my life with a sleep shot in my hands, Steve. Always. Always. Because giants are there to intimidate, to destroy, to rip away, to kill. And they will scare you into oblivion. And they will, they will keep you from living out God's purposes and his design intent for you. That's their purpose. But there's a David inside of you. So hold the rock in your hand, if you will. Let me just pray over you. Heavenly Father, on this Sunday morning, we give you this afternoon. We give you tomorrow. We give you Tuesday. We give you next weekend and two or three months from now. We give you the Christmas of this year and then all of 2020. We don't know necessarily what what all the specifics of life will look like. But what we do know is that you're the God of today and you're the God of tomorrow. And you call us to take down Goliath. David threw the stone. He believed you to be his victor. But there's no doubt in my mind, God, that you and your power, your spirit, was really the one that took Goliath down. So all the giants that face us and all the lies and all the things that they speak over us, we choose instead to believe your word to be true. Give us the courage to face our giants and may you take them down in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. Everybody said, Amen. It's kind of hard to clap with a rock in your hand, but go ahead and clap anyway, you know, somehow, some way. I love you, church. Thank you for being here today. I'm hungry. I hope you join me up in the shelter and we'll eat some barbecue chicken together, all right? Go get your kids, your grandchildren. Let's, uh, let's share a little bit of a meal together. Have a wonderful day. Hope to see you Wednesday night. Bless you.